Okay, we're going to talk about research. And the researchers on campus here are very busy. They're helping to discover new crops and developing new production practices for the horticulture crops in North Dakota. And here to tell us about a summary of her latest findings in work on high value crops is Dr. Harleen Hatterman Valenti. She is a high value crop specialist in the Department of Plant Sciences. So Harleen, welcome to the forum. Thank you, Tom. And I appreciate the opportunity. Um, tonight I'm only going to talk of three crops because we have a limited time and I wanted to go into them a little bit more in advance than just kind of skimming the tops uh, of each of those. And so with that, um, the first uh, crop I'm going to talk about is Juneberries or Saskatoons as they would be called in, in Canada and uh, had a graduate student just finish up with um, her master's in which she was uh, uh, evaluating some of the native selections that um, Dr. Jim Walla and uh, Dr. Joe Selesnick helped with in the selection process. And so we've now gone and collected fruit yield and some other characteristics um, data on this and I thought I'd show it to you. So, um, for those who aren't familiar with what June berries are, um, I always hear this, it's like the poor man's blueberry. And uh, in North Dakota, we know because of the buffering capacity of our soils, it, it would be really hard to grow blueberries. So, why don't we take advantage of Saskatoons or June berries? Um, so, what is uh, a Saskatoon or a Juneberry? Well, it has a very simple flavor profile, and perhaps that is some of the reasons why um, it, it loses some of the flavors shortly after harvest. But most of the time, this uh, fruit is used in processing of pies, jams, um, lemon, lemonades, and, and those kind of things. So it really, um, you know, works still very well. Um, it does have a short shelf life, uh, but I think it actually has a longer shelf life than something that like blueberries, because actually June berries are a miniaturized apple. They have small seeds just like apples. They're a poem. They aren't a blueberry, although for some, the EPA has grouped them in with blueberries because they see that small fruit and said, well, that kind of looks like a blueberry, only a little bit on a purplish color. So they do an excellent job of retaining their shape and, and texture when frozen and thawed. Um, we were trying to see if some of them had higher pectin levels because when we were as fresh, we were squeezing them to get the take some of the data on pH and and bricks and like that. It seemed like the juice would gel up rather quickly on some. Um, that data we're still analyzing, and so and they are very high in antioxidants and so even more so than blueberries so they're even better for you um, as far as locations you know mainly the prairies of canada alaska and of course north dakota uh, there are other amelanchiers that are grown in other locations so other species and actually um they a number of the species actually cross and so I think some of the native ones that we've collected aren't actually just pure Amelanchier ulnifolia. I think they are actually a cross between another species of Amelanchier. So you can see how it's very similar to our, our blueberry, um, except our blueberry is probably grown in a much um, uh, larger area. So, um, as from this data, we looked at the height, and uh, I probably should have went and put, converted this to um, feet. But and we had this study. Uh, we planted these in two locations at the Williston REC as well as the horticulture 
uh, research farm near Absaraka, which we always just label Absaraka because that's the closest town to our location. So um, a meter is about is about three feet. So you can go and figure out that way. And um, it's kind of nice to see that regardless of where uh, these were grown, uh, as far as the tall ones, we had similarities in both locations and the short ones um, likewise. And um, Regent and Northline are two commercial uh, cultivars that we have in the study because you got to have some standards to compare. So these were collected mainly along the northern part of North Dakota. Both one year Jim went to the east half of the state and the next year the west side of the state. And there was about 30 some, um, well actually more, we whittled it down to about um, 30 some that we um, further evaluated. Probably had uh, around a hundred, I would think. And Jim probably tasted twice as many. And so, um, now this table, I just wanted to go and show you as far as the yield. And um, so I have that whole long list and you can see that, um, you know, we have six of them that um, yield very high. Um, how you understand those letters on the uh, next to the numbers is that statistically when you see an A, all those A's are similar. And if you see a B, uh, for example, um, ND1-2 is not different yield-wise than ND1-7, but it is different than ND9-1 and so and on down. But you can see we're having almost, um, you know, 1,800 grams per plant, um, which is, um, and how it goes down and, you know, how you see some of those uh, cultivars that are the industry and, and grown in Canada and, and where they are at. Um, Success and Park Hill and Regent, those three um, were, thought to be a cross actually between Amelanchier omifolia and Amelanchier stolonifera. Uh, they're much more uh, floriferous, uh, so they uh, produce a lot more flowers, and if you have a lot more flowers, you end up with a lot more uh, higher yield. And so um, having taken data on flower production those first six, I have a feeling that they also are probably a cross with um, Ulnifolia and Stolonifera because they would make a beautiful edible landscape. Um, when they flower, that whole plant is just covered with white flowers and it is amazing. And so um, I, I'm hoping that uh, we will be releasing a couple of these in the really near future and that they would be available for um, gardeners and homeowners to have in their backyard. One thing I think everyone knows about Juneberries is um, robins just love them and unfortunately in a town if you do not have them covered with a net they will the robins won't even let them get purple. Uh, they barely turn from green to a pinkish red and the robins are going crazy for them so um, and if the robin likes them that must mean something and they are very nice and sweet so going on now with our blackberry research and and you might go and say blackberries we can't grow blackberries in North Dakota and I will say au contraire um, I had two grad students working on blackberries the first one was uh, looking at primal cane cultivars under um, three different environments. And the, the second one did a study looking at the flora cane cultivar evaluation. Uh, and because it is true that with the flora canes, they can't take the kind of cold temperatures that we have here in North Dakota. So you have to do something to protect that. And we were making some row covers, and we used a rotating cross arm to go and 
have that ability of laying them down and then covering on them. And so I'm going to start with that one because um, some of the work had shown that um, the, the primal canes over winter can't take it down into the, the mid-teens temperatures. And we get way colder than mid-teens. If, if we stayed in mid-teens, we'd probably have everybody coming here um, because of our, our not-so-bad winters and our gorgeous summers. So, so here's a, a couple pictures showing um, how in the fall of 2015 and 2016, um, no, 2014 and 2015, uh, they were covered up. And we used uh, two treatments that had black plastic, and we covered it either with straw or with corn stover, stovers. And then we used a thermal blanket for the other two. And either we left the thermal blanket alone or we used corn stover on that one. Um, on my right, which I hope would be your right too, <laughs> is uh, that rotating cross arm. And how that works is, is, as those primal canes are coming out, we train them onto a, a bottom wire that's probably about a foot above the um, soil surface, going horizontal with the soil surface. And we train it so that after it's about three foot, we'll cut the ends off, and then all those lateral buds will break. And on one half, of the side, the one with the longer arm, that's where we'll, um, the fruit, the floral canes will be, and they'll be fruiting. And then on the, that short one, that's where we're training three or four of those prima canes. And then the other ones will be cutting off because you don't need more than that. Um, and then after the floral canes fruit, you cut those out and you switch it over. Um, it's a unique little system. It's used a lot in the East and in California for more of the shading. They're using that and keeping that at 60% to kind of, so the fruits kind of shade it so they don't have to worry as much about white droplets because in you know the South and the Southeast and California, they get too much heat. And then it causes some problems with with the fruit. So there's our table. And there's only a few things I wanted to really show here. Um, as we, we look at the yield, um, there's two that you, that you see are, are much higher than most of the other ones, and that's Chester Thornless and Illini Hardy. And, you know, Illini Hardy, uh, this probably was enough to go and make David think twice, that thing is extremely thorny. And to go and try to use a thorny cultivar on this rotating cross arm where you really have to handle those canes a lot is ridiculous. So even though it's, we knew it was one of those really, one of the hardiest of the blackberries, um, I do not wish that on to anyone. But Chester Thornless, I think there's some real potential there. Um, in the, the eastern part of the U.S., they use Chester Thornless a lot with uh, making jams because it has some tartness to it. Um, so with the sweetness, um, it gives you that complexity in your, your blackberry jams. And that's probably a standard for blackberry jams. Um, it also tastes great. Um, so, but as you can look here, you know, when, when we were looking at June berries in, in grams of yield, we're, you know, over a thousand. And if these were being grown in Arkansas or somewhere along the East Coast, um, we would be in that range also. Um, so we need to do more if we're going to go and and try to utilize this system because the yields just aren't high enough for us to go and and have someone trying to commercially grow this. Now, for a back home or a backyard gardener, 
you can easily get, and I would go with a, a thornless, even though the thornless tend to be a little bit less hardy than something that's thorny, but you can easily go and lay those down, train them so that you can cover them up in the late fall. And uh, I know somebody in, in the Fargo area, he uses this um, kind of a, a curing blanket that they use for cement or a tarp type thing, covers them up every fall and he has blackberries every summer and he, and, uh, he cherishes those and he also likes to brag about his blackberries and I would too if I could go and, and do something like that. Um, when you look at the bottom part, you can see that the BPC is black plastic corn and um, then black plastic straw, thermal blanket, corn, and thermal blanket alone. And so we see that we had higher yields with that thermal blanket with the corn, much higher than we had with just the thermal blanket. So the thermal blanket isn't enough, but trying to work with corn stovers or wheat straw is a real pain. So what I want to do in the future is I want to go and go with multiple thermal blankets, coverings over that putting that first one out early enough so that when we have some of those temperatures that might quickly dip down into the teens, um, they're covered up and some protection. Also avoiding the wheat straw, I avoid rodents <laughs> quite a bit. So um, we may have went and waited too long before we put our co row coverings on because we were so scared of the rodents and we didn't want to go and have rodent hotel alley in our blackberries. Um, so we, we may have waited too long and those primal canes could have gotten some cold damage. So um, the black plastic, I think the reason we see that that's so low is black plastic doesn't breed and so um, we you know that gets with snow it gets really pounded down on there and there probably wasn't enough oxy oxygen exchange and so we saw the you know the much lower yields in comparison to the thermal blanket with the corn, corn stover so the next one was the primal canes and which we used the high tunnel, just a single layer high tunnel. We used silver mulch and then we used bare ground. And with these primal canes, they were all um, cultivars from John Clark in Arkansas, Prime Jim, Prime Jan, Prime Ark and Prime Freedom. And so, and in the lower left is just a picture. We used uh, a landscape fabric to go and keep things weed free in the high tunnel. Um, and we weeded in between the others. So um, now what we see, look here, we see the number of berries. Now you see that for in the high tunnel, statistically we can't compare are different environments because we didn't have that replicated. We didn't have three locations where we had um, silver mulch. I had only one high tunnel, so there was no way we could go and have three locations with high tunnel. Uh, but you see that there's an NS by the total yields and number of berries for the high tunnel. What that means is even though we had some differences there, statistically they, there was no differences in those yields or the number of berries. When we look at silver mulch though, we see that with the silver mulch, Prime Gem did better than Primark Freedom. And Primark Freedom, um, you can kind of see, really kind of wasn't doing the, the best um, in, in comparison. And it, it really is, it is, uh, kind of unique. It, it is thornless and so that was the real nice thing but it would have these canes that were 15 feet long in the high tunnel and was um, uh, really going gangbusters. Now what Abby did is she also looked at tipping and there was an interaction with tipping 
for the silver mulch. And so that's why tipping is there. And what we found is with that double tipping, we're just delaying things way too much. Abby would tip the first time when the, the stems were 18 inches tall. And then when she had an additional, she'd do another tipping. And, and what the tipping does is basically you're trying to force more laterals, which if we had a much longer growing season, we probably would have more fruit. We did get more fruit. However, if it isn't ripe, it's really not worth it. And it just goes and it's hard on those plants um, trying to produce this fruit that never ripens. And then at the very bottom, you see the bare soil. And um, you can see how um, there, actually, the prime arc 45 uh, was one of the, the worst ones. But again, we see NS. So statistically, there was no difference in the bare soil. Now, what I'm trying to do with these um, primal canes is a lot of places are using the primal canes, especially the Primark 45, as flora canes. So my thought is, if we can't get enough yield with these primal canes, what I need to do is I need to leave us, you know, a foot of those primal canes. Then those buds, as long as I protect them and they survive the winter, they'll become flora canes and they'll break those. And so hopefully I can increase the fruit production by making like a pseudo, what I call double cropping. And so I tried this last winter in which in the past we would, we would cut everything off and then we put a thermal blanket and some straw over it. Well, I did that, except for now you have some of these stems that are a foot tall. Um, so the thermal blanket went over that, and the straw went over that, and then the wind came, and it blew the straw away. And just like we saw in with the Florida Kings, that thermal blanket alone doesn't really provide enough winter protection. So this last winter, what I did was I'm going to hope I, I put out a lot of mouse bait, um, but I put the straw around the stems, and then I covered it with the thermal blanket. So. I reversed my um, insulation practice, and I'm hoping that this does a much better job of protecting these primal canes so that they will break bud and actually have uh, flora canes that um, we can go in and uh, collect fruit from. So the last thing I wanna talk about is potatoes. Now, how we go from fruit to potatoes, ooh, I don't know, but, um, I, I think as gardeners, one has to be kind of concerned about spray drift. And so, and what I'm doing this for is really for uh, commercial growers, but a lot of the things also relate to, to gardeners because we have now dicamba uh, tolerant soybeans. But for a gardener, dicamba is used a lot of times in turf on turf grass to control broad leaves and and what we were looking at is the combination of glyphosate and dicamba and what we found was that dicamba alone is much more injurious on potatoes than glyphosate glyphosate or roundup really is much stronger on grasses than it is on broad leaves dicamba on the other hand is much more tougher on broad leaves than it is on grasses. That's why it's it was labeled in cereals and corn and like that and turf grass. So um, we looked at a chipping variety, but I've done a lot of work on all kinds of potatoes. Um, and I found that reds are the most sensitive um, and then everything else is a little is less sensitive as far as types of potatoes. So we did this at two locations. And last year, um, basically the only thing that came up that was significant was that, um, that green bar, which was um, our culls. So they were less than four ounces. And basically I showed that with that high rate of glyphosate, uh, Roundup, 
or the high rate of dicamba, second high rate of dicamba, or that combination and all combinations, we had more calls. And so um, you can see how things dip up and down, but nothing was significantly different. So you can see that with some of those higher rates, and especially when we went with dicamba and glyphosate together, we really went and reduced the marketable yield. But we really didn't see that much difference to the untreated. And so on the left-hand side is the untreated. And so that's, you know, and in fact, some of those we actually, um, and it is known that low rates of dicamba can actually stimulate growth. And that's maybe what happened with, you know, some of that dicamba, but it wasn't significant. So why did this happen? And I wanted to bring it back to, um, two years ago, um, this is combined data when we were looking on a russet type of potatoes. And you can see that oaks and inkster, um, oaks is the blue and inkster is in the um, yellow. And we can see how we had some really big differences. Our high rate of glyphosate, which is the GLY5, um, you know, almost a uh, hundred hundred weight per acre difference that's you know that's a lot um and we didn't really understand why we could see such differences at at oaks we got in there early we saw after we made these spray applications we saw injury at inkster we didn't we saw very little injury which wasn't what we expected at all and so I start looking at the weather data and I looked at the maximum and, and minimum air temperatures. And that first star on the left is when we made our application at Oaks. We had some nice cool temperatures, potatoes like cool temperatures. So when we made that application and this is, you know, just a, a drift type of application, the potatoes responded really well to the injury. However, later um, when we made that, um, our other application, that was, well, we had some rain delays, so our application came much later in Inkster. We had some high temperatures, both at night and in the daytime, and so the potatoes were already stressed, so they didn't respond to this other stress as well. But what happened was when we went and if we were to go in and uh, we took samples from those daughter tubers that were in the ground, when we look at Inkster and Dicamba, we see we had high amounts, rather high amounts of, of residues. Now we made this application when the potatoes were probably only about a nickel to a quarter in size. So for that to actually occur seems really strange. Now oaks, this is what we expected, um, that during that time, those potatoes aren't that sink, and so they wouldn't be taking, pulling in all of this um, herbicide residue. Um, kind of goes the same with what we, have, what we see um, at, um, with glyphosate, although we do see that we did get some in oaks. So what I'm really concerned about is that if potatoes are stressed and if we have seed growers that they actually um, had a drift, they wouldn't see as much symptoms because the potatoes were stressed initially, then a drift comes. They don't know that they have this problem. They sell their seed, people go and plant it, and then all of a sudden things don't come up because they have these herbicide residues. So I have a graduate student now um, that is gonna be working at, looking at what is the environmental stresses that is gonna cause this problem so that we can go and help the growers uh, to have um, you know, seed that isn't gonna be injured because we know that dicamba still, they made some new rules and regulations, but it's still gonna be available for um, the the soybean growers to use 
And so I think with that. Okay, <clears throat> let's get right to the questions. How about, let's, let's talk about the fruits. Uh, where are your trials done? Is it only in Fargo or Absaraca, for example? Okay, so um, the Primal King one was done in, in Fargo. And the fluorocaine one was done in Absaraca. So. And so people are interested in this research. They can come and visit the plots like you have a field day every yes. year. And mm -hmm. so, so that would be a great opportunity. And there's uh, like graduate students will be there to, or Harleen will be there to explain what's going on in the plot itself. So take advantage of those uh, special opportunities at the field days both at Absaraca and on campus, and you can see this research with your own eyes. Um, but otherwise, it's not open to the visitors in general, right? Yeah. Unless um, I have to call you for a special appointment. Maybe. Right. I mean, you could, on campus, you can, and because it's just up from the demonstration gardens, you can walk around, but not knowing what's what, right. it really does, I mean, oh, there's some blackberries. <laughs> Okay, so uh, speaking of blackberries, do, do they require any special soil amendments to grow here? No, that's the nice thing is, and you know, of course you gotta keep up your fertility, but um, just like a raspberry, um, they, it's more, the only issue with blackberries is the hardiness right. or lack of hardiness. Uh, with that, uh, with those thermal blankets you cover the entire plant yeah what you do so that that's what that rotating cross arm is is nice about um, because uh, you know um, if we knew we were going to have enough snow before it got really cold then we wouldn't need that but we we can't guarantee that and, and so that rotating arm just is laid down and then we just cover everything up if some of those canes were outside of being covered up, they most likely would, that would die back. And in fact, even some of the stuff under died back a ways, indicating that we may have not got those covers on early enough or that the plastic was injurious and, and depriving of some of the oxygen that it may have needed. And, you know, some of those blackberry cultivars that you listed are rated zones six to nine, but with winter protection, they may survive North mm -hmm. Dakota. That's your, that's yep, your, that's my take. That's your challenge. Yes, that was another thing we found quite interesting was uh, depending on where you looked on the internet for plant right. material, right. Uh, we had stuff, they said it was listed from right. zone four to zone seven, it was like, come on, right. it's the same plant, it can't be that different. That's right. That's why you have a university to give you research-based information. We're not trying to sell you something. Um, and I, uh, you mentioned that you, you uh, use a bait to manage mice, Bowls for yes. overwintering. Mm -hmm. That's what works for you. Yeah. Um, I mean, we we could. Uh, we have these little. Yeah, it's bait inside these little black boxes. And yeah, we go so. to Carrington too. How about? Uh, can you plant blackberries next to raspberries, or should you keep them apart? Does it uh, matter? You, well. Um, I, I don't think you, I mean, there, the same kind of diseases will probably affect both. And so, um, so, I, I mean, you could plant them next to each other, but, you know, having them next to each other, if one gets it, then the next is going to get something like a phytophthora right. or something or like that. Same. But there's no real pollination issues with that. No. No, don't worry about that. Um, it says there's a question about uh, higher antioxidants, sometimes more tartness. Is that the case with these berries? Well, actually, um, phenolics don't necessarily mean, um, uh, you know, acidity and so the usually the darker the color so the dark deeper the purple 
the more phenolics and anthocyanins, and thus the healthier. Um, I know you can't uh, be, t uh, this is a difficult one, but purchasing June berries or hardy blackberries, do you have a list? Do you have a few nurseries that you might be able to point people towards? Yeah, so we're working on the June berries. You know, the main reason we started this trial was the fact that most everything was only available in Canada. And Canada would go and say, you have to have $500 worth before you can, you know. Um, there are some places that, um, well, even Cheyenne Gardens, I know, will have a plant or two in, in a quart or a gallon uh, gallon container potted. Um, and so uh, we were looking with this research to go and have more local sources as well as, you know, I think just like some of the other small fruits, it's native. It it can grow here easily. Um, and they're you know, just like up in Manitoba, there are um, a number of orchards and it's a commercial crop. Um, it's very possible to do the same thing here. But having the source is the main thing. How about uh, what's the, if you had to buy a Juneberry variety, what would you grow? <laughs> well, well, I'd wait until we come up with wait one. Of the, get yeah. those developed. Yeah. When's that going to happen? Uh, I I would think we have three years of data, fruit data on it. Um, so I'm hoping that this this is be the fourth year that we should have enough data to at least release one, if not more. Because your yields are are uh, much higher than the. The standard, uh, yeah. the more commonly available varieties, mm -hmm. like almost double, huh? Um, can we? Is there a place to get that Chester thornless blackberry? Um, yeah, we. You know, um, I know we went. There's a Cornell site that really mm -hmm. has that lists for small fruits all the nurseries and it has a really good description of uh, what's available at the various nurseries. I think we okay. went through Norse Farms for Norse. a lot of yeah. our stuff, but Norse um, is a big one. Yeah, you can only. I think you can just Google it, and usually you can find some sources. Um, what else we got here? You know that dicamba drift concerns. You know how far can that drift occur from? Depends on the situation. Depends on the situation. Um, you know, uh, it's volatile. So when you have temperatures over 85 degrees, um, you know, the, and uh, of course wind, and it uh, will drift the particles. But you know, the volatility. Anytime you, uh, we have temperatures over 85, uh, you're increasing the chances of some volatilization occurring. And dicamba can uh, spread through the soil too on the yes, ground, right? It is. It can be taken up through the root system. Yeah. Uh, but glyphosate, not so much. Right. Okay, we got a bird lover here. It just gets depressed every time she sees a robin in the netting. Got an answer yes. for that? Um. Shoot the robin and take it out of its misery. <laughs> <laughs> Survival yeah, of the fittest, uh, is dumb robin? You know, I think you can probably, depending on what kind of netting you get, you know, that, that extruded plastic is, a, is very unforgiving. Um, there are some others that is more flexible, but I think the smaller you, the smaller the holes, the mesh, the, the mesh yeah, the less likely. It's a um, finer mesh. That we just sense. we put a big dome over ours yeah. so that we can work under there and, and not have to worry. But even then, you know, yeah, they see those things and they're right. just like that's right. You just just like gold. Yeah. Can't control themselves. So they had a gardener who grew eighteen hundred feet of June berries. He planted it during a high moisture year, but they got mold and died. Oh. Was that like a root rot, you think maybe right. got it, it or something? Could have been. They're, June berries are you know they're they're very nondescript as far as soil requirements, um, but I have heard in heavier soils that um, it's you know they they don't like wet peat in the fall, and so I've had some people in the Red River Valley saying 
my, uh, you know, I bought a Juneberry and it, it was this tall and eight years later, it's this tall, you know, mm. what's going on. Mm. And, and it's really, I think the, the moisture in the fall that um, is hurting things. Right. How about, there's a question about what is the root system like on blackberry? So it's more of a crown system. Um, that's the nice part about it um, versus like a, a red raspberry where it'll start spreading all over the place. Oh. So it's more like a black raspberry and more uh, and a crown system. Okay, so we're just going to wrap it up. We want to stay on uh, the topic as much as possible, but we do have some expertise here on fruits in general. So I don't know. I'm going to throw a couple more at you. A few curveballs here. How about uh, how do you protect strawberries from sand flies? I know what a sand fly is myself. Okay, uh, just pause yeah, on that. that. That should have been the entomologist before. <laughs> <laughs> Alex answered that one. Uh, and cedar apple rust. How do we control cedar uh, apple rust? Yes. So the cedar apple rust is a problem with June berries. Um, and so, especially at Williston, because they have a row of cedars right on the north side of the Juneberries. And so, um, you know, the whole thing is breaking that life cycle. Um, if you have cedar next to Juneberries or apples, it's going to, you know, and you have the right kind of weather conditions, you're going to have this problem. So, if you could have your apples or your Juneberries as far from cedars as possible um especially not downwind <laughs> uh, about always that those uh those juniper those there's you know those those spores from junipers can fly for a long yeah. time miles mm -hmm. but how about resistant varieties if possible or maybe a targeted spray in the spring as a right. preventative mm -hmm. that's about Yep. Cedar apple rust usually isn't a killer of plant. Right, it's just ugly. It's just ugly. Just ugly. <laughs> and uh, so. What would be your favorite among the shorter June berries? Do you have a, a variety that you prefer? Well, actually, there wasn't one on here, but it's a, it's an old one called Tim's that um, I really like because it kind of tastes really um, cinnamonish mm -hmm. or kind of nutmeg like. Um, but it's a much older um, variety. Otherwise, you know, um, Martin has probably the largest fruit, and you know, if that's the whole thing of harvesting, if you have to pick it by hand, you'd much rather pick something like this than something like this. You know, right. um, so how do you spell Tim? It, it's T I M M. T I M M. Mm -hmm. Okay, never heard of it. But otherwise, Martin could be a yeah, good Yeah, Martin Parm, That's pretty popular. Yeah, Martin's really popular. Um, it's a sport off of Tyson, and and so those uh, now there are some others like that Par 90 that have large fruit as well, but um, uh, and Lee 8. But really, I I stick with Martin. So looking ahead. In five years, we're going to have an NDSU Juneberry cultivar release that's very promising. And we'll have a production guide for backyard blackberry production. Is that right? Yeah. Is that five years? I, I, yeah. Okay, there we go. That's what I want to hear. Sounds good. Sounds great. Sounds really interesting. And any other last questions out there? I think we got them all. Okay, here you see none. We're going to wrap this up. Thank you, awesome. Harleen, for that Thank you. really interesting talk.